Hi guys, I hope you're doing really well. My name is Sarah and welcome to What the Horror, the channel where we talk about horror movies old and new. So, as you will have already figured out from the title and thumbnail, today we are talking about and reviewing the newly released The Strangers Chapter 1. After their car breaks down, a couple driving cross-country to begin a new life in the Pacific Northwest is forced to spend the night in a secluded rental, where they are terrorised from dusk till dawn by three masked strangers. So this review is going to be broken down into two sections. I am going to do a spoiler-free section and then at the end we're going to get into spoilers because I am dying to talk about certain aspects of this film and that is certainly going into spoiler territory. I will, however, give a visual warning and an audio warning when we get into spoilers. So if you haven't seen the film yet, don't worry, nothing will be spoiled for you. Um, and stick around for the first part of this review because I'll be talking about is this film worth seeing. So I will do non-spoilers, then I will say whether I think this is worth watching, first of all, but also is it worth watching in the theatres or on streaming? Because as I have been talking recently in my uh, reviews, going to the theatre is a luxury these days. With the cost of living most places in the world, um, it, we don't all have the money to be going to the theatre for every single film. So I will let you know, in my opinion, if it is worth seeing on the big screen or if it is worth waiting until it's on video on demand or streaming or physical media. Then we will get into the spoiler bit at the end, so if you have seen the film you can stick around for that and we will get a little bit more into the meaty part of it. So what is interesting about this film, and I am going to include this in spoiler free because I don't really think it is a spoiler necessarily, but I want to talk about the fact that this film has been advertised and marketed to us or described to us as a prequel, a prequel trilogy to the original film. Now, the original The Strangers came out way back in 2008 with a sequel to it a whopping 10 years later. The sequel was called The Strangers Pray at Night, with the original film kind of been set in the 60s, 70s, with Strangers Pray at Night being more set in the 80s. So with this one being marketed as a prequel, you would have had the issue of having to set it in a particular time period. But within this film, they have things like um, smart mobile phones, smart cars, and there is older technologies like vinyl players and things like that, but there is definitely clues to it being set in the modern day. So that is one reason why I don't think this is a straight up prequel. There are also certain things in this film that are very reminiscent of the original The Strangers film. There are many things here that are essentially lifted out of that film. It is a very similar, but not beat for beat, not exact copy of the original. People have been, some people reviewing this film have been saying it is exactly the same film, but it isn't actually exactly the same. It is very similar though, very similar. So that is another reason why I'm not sure that this is actually a prequel. However, after having seen the film and the ending of the film and the mid credits of the film, I would say that this is potentially going to be still going to be an explanation of who the strangers are. I think that this first film is going to be setting up a premise and reintroducing people to this world, to this universe, to the characters of the villains. And then I think that the next two installments, chapter two and chapter three, will delve more into who the strangers are. And so because we'll be getting an explanation, we'll be getting an origin story, perhaps you could then say that that is a prequel to the first and the second, The Strangers. I'm I'm not sure. I'm not fully sure why it has been marketed as a prequel. I think it's one of those things where everything will make more sense once we've had all of the films released and maybe we're all just kind of scrabbling for bits of information to make sense at the moment. But that is the first thing I wanted to address. So we are going to be getting chapter two, I believe at the end of this year and then chapter three next year. So this in itself is wonderful news because if you are a fan of the Strangers films, the Stranger films, um, or if you are a fan of this one and you are looking forward to the rest of the trilogy, you don't have long to wait. There's not gonna be a gap of two years in between each film. Each film has been done, is made, is ready to go. 
I believe. They may be doing some tweaks on the third one, but they have the story it is set in. There is already a clear path. I will also say that I don't think you have to have seen The Strangers or The Strangers Pray at Night to enjoy this new entry in the Strangers franchise. While there are plenty of little Easter eggs and little nods to the previous films, you don't have to have any prior knowledge of these characters or of this world to enjoy this film. So you could come to this brand new and you're not going to miss anything and you will be able to enjoy it on its own as its own individual film or entry in the franchise. The response I've been seeing online has been for the most part pretty negative. I however am here to say um, I didn't dislike this film. I am not here to be very negative on this film. I will point out a few bits that I didn't love, but for the most part, I actually enjoyed this film. You know, maybe it'll surprise you. Maybe people think, were we watching the same film? But I think what has happened with The Strangers Chapter One is this is a technically good film, but it is fairly similar to the first film. So perhaps it feels a little unnecessary and a little redundant and perhaps this is what people have taken issue with. I don't agree with the half star ratings and the one star ratings. This is a well made film and I will get into specifics in a moment but yeah for me I actually gave it three stars and a heart on Letterboxd and I think I've actually since I've watched it in the last 24 hours it has fluctuated back and forth between three stars and three and a half and I can't decide which it is. Uh, but it is one of those. I actually liked this film, I had a good time with it, and I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. That helped me. I went into this with very low expectations. I was very tired. I hadn't slept very well. So I thought, right, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to relax into my seat and enjoy the film. And I just was not expecting a lot. And maybe that is how I took more from it because I found myself genuinely enjoying this film. And maybe this is not a good advert for a horror film that is supposed to horrify you. But there were moments of this film that were so relaxing. It was such a wonderful film to watch whilst I was feeling tired. I just felt so relaxed watching it. And also it was kind of cozy, the setting of it and the colors. It was, yeah, it was quite cozy. Like I say, that's not what you want from your horror film, but hey. So the cast in this film, let's, start, let's talk about the cast and the characters. It mostly follows the young couple. And then you have a few villagers and a few locals of the town of Venus where they break down in. Um, I have to say of the two, it is Madeline Pesh. Pesh? Pesh? I always forget how to pronounce her name. I apologize. But Madeline Pesh, she is doing the heavy lifting of the two. Uh, the young guy is fine. He's not bad. But I think that in terms of caring about the character, and performance, she delivers a lot more. And that could be down to the fact that there are moments in the film where she is literally carrying parts of the film. There are scenes that focus on her more, but I would say that, yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good outing. I know her mostly from Riverdale and Riverdale is a TV show that is hammy. It's not known for its grounded central performances. It is over the top. So it was really nice to see her have material that was a lot more grounded. And I think she did really well with it. One of the main positives of this film for me has to be the visuals. This is a really beautiful film. It's somewhere where there's loads of woodland and trees and even the little town of Venus. It feels like it's in the middle of nowhere. So you have this already natural color palette of greens and browns and rusts and things like that and oranges. And then there's the sort of wooden rustic cabin that they stay in and the interiors as well. Very same uh, color palette. And it's just visually very, very pleasing. And also some beautiful scenes, some beautiful moments of cinematography. Uh, this one particular scene set up in the log cabin where the female character Madeline Pesh, she's playing the piano and the way that is framed, what happens within that scene is just, it's so visually pleasing. There's also a lot of reliance on technology, the shots that they have that are focusing on the vinyl player, on their phones, on the um, sort of ignition button of the car, which sounds really strange, but I think there's just this highlight on the different types of technology. The sound design as well, oh my goodness, the sound design was so good, so, so good. The score 
uh, was lovely, but I mean the sound design in the, what would you call it? Is it the wild sound? Like the, the sounds of the situation. So they have a log fire burning in the cabin and the crackle of that is wonderful. There is a grandfather clock with a pendulum. So it's a very loud, boomy uh, tick of the clock, which is very reminiscent of a heartbeat, but it's very focused on a lot of the time. It's there in the background. Sometimes you're more aware of it than others. And um, there's a lot of creaky floorboards within the cabin that they stay, which is very important for setting up scares and eerie moments. But just even when it's a calm moment, hearing the creaks and the groans as the house settles or the people move around, it translated so well into the theatre and I think that if you watch this it is good to watch it with a really good sound system although there were so many quiet parts in this film that you could see there were people sat there with their snacks and no one wanted to eat or do anything because the rustles were so loud compared to the quiet of the film beautiful film sound design is incredible characters are fine acting is fine so so far we're doing good now as for the scares this is a very 50 50 film for me now as you will know if you watched my last episode i have been up to here in research uh, i've been absolutely drowning in research for the evolution and the history of the jump scare and so i was sat there going right okay well we've had the car window scare and we've had the fridge door scare and we've we've had the this scare and we've had the that scare and i could tick them all off this film does unfortunately have a high number of jump scares if you like jump scares then great these are going to work for you if you don't like them they're probably not going to work for you but i don't think it's enough to take away from the film because believe me there are also some genuinely, um, I don't want to say scary because I think what we find scary is very subjective. What you might find scary, I might not. But there are scenarios created through the camera, through the just the situation, through the sounds that are genuinely eerie and unnerving. If you think about the position or the situation that these two characters are in there are some pretty sinister moments some moments that make like you shiver like it sends a tingle up your spine I don't even mean if you are a fan of home invasion just overall i think there are some genuinely well crafted scary moments and so i am more forgiving of the jump scares because they went to the effort of the slow build and the actual atmosphere as well as a a cheaper jump scare. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up the spoiler free bit because there isn't much more that I can say. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not a five out of five star film for me. It's not the strongest one, um, but I think that there are definitely positives to this. In terms, just going back to the horror for a moment, in terms of the horror and the violence and the kills, this is a 15 or a PG-13. So it's not a very bloody film, but I think that this isn't the kind of film that needs blood and gore and that kind of violence. I think there is just a violent undertone to the story anyway, that I don't think that takes uh, away from it in my opinion. But again, it really depends on what you're looking for from your horror. And um, I would say this is certainly worth checking out. Definitely one to give uh, a watch. Is it worth going to the cinema for? Because let's be honest, it's not the most original horror film. It's not really doing anything that new. So perhaps it is worth waiting for, for video on demand or physical media. Because like I said, I would check this out for sure. But the only thing that makes me question that advice is the sound design. The sound worked so well in the cinema, the darkness, the quiet. I just, I wonder if you were watching it at home and there was light and distractions, if it would be as enjoyable. I'm wondering if I would have enjoyed it as much. So there is that side of it that if you can or you want to, then sure, go see it because it's worth it for the sound design. In terms of going to the cinema as a treat and which of the films this year would I say go see, this is probably not going to be one of those, but definitely check it out. I definitely had a good time with it. I am intrigued to see chapter two and chapter three. So yeah, that will be the spoiler free bit done. Now we're going into spoilers. This isn't going to take too long because I've already been talking for quite a while. But, so this is your one. If you haven't seen the film yet, skedaddle for everybody else. Let's talk a little bit more about The Strangers. Okay, so 
one of the things I just want to highlight is people have been describing this film as exactly like the original. It is not exactly like the original and that's what I want to talk about in two ways. First off, the couple. In the first film, the couple had had a missed opportunity, I think, of one had proposed and one had said no. And so there was this friction between the couple. They're put in this situation and they're already sort of a log ahead. So how are they going to survive through it? And then realising do they love each other at the risk of losing the other one. In this film, the couple is very much together, very much in love. There is the discussion of marriage, but they're both on the same page with it. And so in this one, they're a united front. And I quite like that. I like that they did something a little bit different. You know, it's a couple who do like each other, are in love. And so the idea of seeing the other one suffer when they're finally in that end scene where they're tied to the chair and they're looking at each other, knowing the other one is going to die or they're both going to die. That is a horrific scenario to be in. And so I like that they made a change in the character. And maybe this is why I cared about them more because there was moments where they were being silly, moments where they were being loving. And and with the other ones in the original, they just felt a little bit money and mongy. And I know that probably doesn't make sense to you, but I just, I think the first film just feels so heavy with, oh, everything's so bad. Whereas in this one, there's some moments of sweetness and light and that makes for a good contrast. The other major one, uh, that is different is the strangers. The whole dynamic, the whole setup and what's the word, the motive as we know it at the moment is completely different from the original film and I love that. In the original film uh, I have done the true stories or the true inspiration, a truly horror episode on the strangers uh, I will leave a link to it here or if you want to, there is a playlist of my Truly Horror episodes, you can check that out. But basically one of the things that inspired it was the Manson family and how uh, it was the, the murders of the Biancas and or the LaBiancas, I think they're called, and the, the, the Tate house. And it was the idea of people being in their home, in their place of safety and people just turning up randomly and killing them. That was the premise of the first film. That was the couple's home. In this one, the couple are in a place they've never been before. They're in an Airbnb. They are there on holiday. Well, they're going somewhere on holiday. And so it's not their home. The strangers haven't just come upon them in their home, picking them at random. This feels more like a setup and curated scenario. This reminded me so much of multiple early 2000 films like House of Wax remake, like The Wrong Turn, or is it just called Wrong Turn? And also Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where you have village or uh, town or the gas station or the convenience store, the grocery store, and the people working in there are in cahoots with uh, the antagonists, the villains, and they set up this scenario to get people to either the Texas Chainsaw House or to the Wax Museum or to what is it in the wrong turn, like where the, the three mountain men live. These scenarios are set up so they can get victims. And that's what this felt like to me. It felt like the town of Venus, a lot of people there were in on it. To me, it felt like the garage mechanic broke the car. The people in the diner are in on it as well. Like the guy in the beginning, the business guy, he had gone there. I think he'd stayed at the B&B, Airbnb. He'd gone to the diner. He was passing through. So they have these strangers, these people come into their town and they set it up that they can't leave so that someone, some person or some people can then hunt them. And that's what I think it is. I think it was set up to create the scenario so this young couple could be hunted and killed by the strangers. And so this changes the dynamic. The strangers are not going out there randomly attacking homes. They are making scenarios where strangers, visitors come into the town and are then killed within the town setting by having all these different people involved in it, making it possible to happen. And there was an interesting comment made. It was when the car had broken down and the mechanic was talking to the lady who worked in the diner and they were saying, oh yeah, this is Airbnb, it's owned by so-and-so, uh, except, you know, it's free to use, except for this time when he's hunting. Yes, yeah, so-and-so, he loves hunting. Now, if the guy 
who was killed, who had come to fix the fridge is the owner, then he's not one of the strangers. But it was just the wording of, yeah, they love to do hunting. And I just thought hunting people because we'd seen them do it with the businessman at the beginning. We know they're going to do it with this young couple. So the strangers are hunting humans, they're hunting people. Uh, so that's my prediction. My prediction is that the town was in on it. And I think that some of the people we saw in the diner, perhaps even the mechanic, was he called Rudy? I think some of those people are gonna be who the strangers are. I think that is why the female strangers had uh, the black beanie hats on under their masks, so we couldn't see their hair color. I've seen some people comment on doll faces uh, look and how it's not as good. And I do agree to a point. Uh, I love the stranger with like the the beach wavy blonde hair, but I think in this one, every one of the strangers, their whole head is covered, their hair and the face, so that we don't know that it's one of the townspeople. That's my prediction. I also wondered if the strangers in this film are different to the ones in the other one. If those strangers from like the 60s or the 70s and then the 80s, maybe they're just a different generation. This is a newer generation. There's something about this connection to a religion. They kept trying to hand out these pamphlets. At the burger place, there was the two boys on the bike. When the young couple walk into the, the diner, they already have one in their hand. And then the person behind the counter at the diner also tries to give them one. So there's all these people trying to push this religious-based pamphlet on them. And I wonder if that has some connection to the stranger's motive as well. Um, so yeah, those are my predictions, but I do feel like it changes the entire dynamic of it. It makes the motive completely different. And so this is where I wonder, can they make it in the same universe, but just they're different strangers because it's people doing this thing through perhaps a belief, perhaps through a religious belief, a cult belief, a cultural belief, I don't know. But I, that's why I really liked it. I was one of those people who saw the trailer and I went, that is just the first film, that's exactly the same. But it's not, there are differences. And I appreciate that because it meant that when I watched the first, The Strangers, I think on my letterbox review, I said, I wish I'd seen this not knowing anything. I already knew all the scares. I already knew all the reveals. I already knew the ending. And that's perhaps why I didn't enjoy it as much. With this one, I went in thinking it won't be brilliant and it will be exactly the same as the other. It was better than I thought and there were differences. So I was surprised by some of what was revealed, which I appreciated. So that is my review of The Strangers Chapter One. Now, like I say, I've seen a lot of hate for this film. So perhaps some of you have watched this and gone, what is she on about? But I just don't think it is as bad as some people are making out. And I would love to hear if some other people have seen some, you know, good aspects to it as well. There are some people I follow on Letterboxd who are giving it around the three, three and a half uh, rating as well and seem to agree that it's not as bad as some people are making out. I'm not saying they're wrong. I just think it's a shame that, um, well, I'm not saying either are wrong. I think you could tell that either way. I'm not saying anybody's wrong in their opinion. I just think it's a shame that, um, People didn't get as much enjoyment from it as I did. But yeah, that that's my review. I was honestly pleasantly surprised. I'm looking forward to the other two. I'll be interested to see how my predictions turn out. And it is because of this new shift in dynamic that I am intrigued by two and three. That is what is making me look forward to them. I'm not chomping at the bit like I am with Maxine, but I will certainly be checking them out uh, with intrigue. If you have seen the film, do let me know in the comments below. Um, maybe though, because it's a new one, give a little spoiler warning before uh, we have a little chat about it, but do let me know your thoughts, whether you liked it or not. Uh, I would love to hear different people's take on it. Um, if you found me through this episode, uh, do please give this video a, a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and hit that subscribe button so you can join the What The Horror family. Uh, and if you would like to join these wonderful names here, these are my lovely Patreon members. They keep the lights on here. They give me a lot of support <laughs> in many different ways. And um, they are also privy to extra content every single week. Uh, so if you would like to join them, there is a link to my Patreon page in the description box below. But if you don't want to, that is also fine. I also appreciate all the love and support that I get here. You guys are incredible. So in the meantime, thank you as always, like I say, for stopping by and showing some support. Um, I really do appreciate every like, every comment, every view. And take care of yourselves and I will talk to you in the next episode. Bye guys. <laughs>